Hello everyone, I'm very excited to be bringing you my first ever collaboration video and I'm very excited that my first collaborator is Regan from Henka Reads Books. After watching a few of his videos, I realized that we have a very similar taste and that's when an idea was born of maybe we should exchange our favorite books and see what we think of them. And the two books that he gave me were Misery by Stephen King and Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. I'm just about to head out to the library because I just got the notification that my books have arrived. So cue the montage. Lead me on cause I love it. I don't have much going on. So fuck it, I'm right with you. I just finished Misery and I have to say this was so 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 good. I loved it. In fact, I couldn't stop reading it and I finished it in two days. And when I couldn't read it because university stuff, I had the audiobook on and the audiobook was fantastic. And honestly, I think it could have also increased my enjoyment of the book as well because the narrator was, oh my god, especially the latter parts of the book, chef's kits. I adored how this book discusses fandom and oh my gosh, it's so much more likely now that something like this could happen. Mm, wait, no, maybe it wouldn't because of like the cameras and stuff. But I mean, just look at Taylor Swift's stalker being released from prison like three times and then showing right back up at her house again the next day. Also, Loki, I'm scared that this is going to happen to Brandon Sanderson if he decides to kill Kaladin in Stormlight 5. <laughs> I think a big strength for this point is Paul Sheldon's POV itself because we can see his psyche devolving periodically throughout the book and it is terrifying. It also asks the question of to what extent should fans stick with their favorite artist if the artist decides to switch genres. And some real world examples that I can think of that kind of go both ways are you have Taylor Swift and she changes genres with every single music album and her fans seem to love it, but then you have The Witcher, which changed a lot from the source material to its Netflix adaptation, and the fans, including myself, reacted horribly because it was an awful adaptation. There's this question of, does the author owe something to their fans if what made them fans in the first place makes the author feel creatively restrained. But yeah, as I kind of said earlier, I wonder how this would play out in today's world. Like, I'd love to see an adaptation of it with like, you know, social media, cameras, surveillance, etc. Because, I mean, we just had the where is Kate gate and <laughs> look how that turned out. And yeah, I really think that this is one that could have an interesting new spin. I also got very excited when the overlook was mentioned in like one sentence halfway through the book because I was like, I, I see you, I see you, I see the connections. There is a spoiler thing that I do want to discuss, but I'll discuss it in my interview with Henka, so stick till the end of the video for that, because that's the only reason why my rating was lowered. Oh my gosh, and I didn't say the rating. It's a eight and a half, like, so good. I really hope that Norwegian Wood is just as good, because right now I'm soaring really high, so <laughs> this was fantastic. And I'll update you when I finish Norwegian Wood. I just finished Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami and unfortunately I didn't love it as much as Misery. In fact, I can't really say I loved it at all. I can't pinpoint it exactly, but something about it just really felt disingenuous. What did he say? Before I talk more about this book, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a background so that you're not lost in case you don't know what it's about. We're following this college guy called Toru Watanabe as he starts university and gets closer with uh, his childhood best friend called Naoko, with whom he is tied due to the death of their mutual best friend. But then after a while, he also gets to know this girl called Midori, who is more lively and uh, kind of like the stark opposite to Naoko, who is much more tied to uh, this death. There's a quote that Sanderson said that has really, really stuck with me. And it's that the role of authors is to not give answers, but to give readers questions um, to think upon. And I feel like Haruki Murakami didn't do either in this book. Go, Go girl, give us nothing. Ah! The main character, Toru, is he, he's so 
ugh, like he has barely any self-reflection. In fact, he reads almost like a wannabe Holden from The Catcher in the Rye, which is one of my favorite books ever. He just felt so contrived. And then don't even get me started on the female characters in this book because... Sir, have you encountered a woman in your life? And if you have, and if they're acting like this, I'm so sorry. First of all, we have Naoko. And Naoko never feels like a fully realized breathing character, in my opinion. She's there to serve the purpose of like the depressed manic pixie dream girl. And then Midori on the other side is like the really happy manic pixie dream girl. Like that's what they feel like. Okay, spoiler. There's this one scene where she like stands over Toru naked in the middle of the night and then like for what reason? I don't know. She does. She wakes up and is like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stand naked in the moonlight over this man and then I'm gonna pretend this didn't happen. Why does she do that? <laughs> and there's like such a focus like on her body and like pretty much nothing else because like even after she dies, um, Toru is like, oh, I miss her flesh. Then we have Midori and she's so weird. <laughs> Prefacing what I'm about to say, sex is a very big part of this book. And I kind of got the idea that Midori is supposed to stand in for the sexually liberated female character. But if this is what sexual liberation is for you, I'm so sorry. Um, no, it's th this is not it. She almost seems to be vulgar only for shock value. Arnar. And although I did find some things about her to kind of ring true to like being a woman and stuff because I think love is really an act of noticing and there's a scene where she gets annoyed that Toru didn't notice a change in her appearance and she really tried to like, I don't know, look beautiful for him and he didn't even notice so I, I, I do under kind of feel empathetic to that when you're kind of like, oh I'm trying, I'm trying to look pretty for you and you're not even noticing. So I did kind of relate to that, but I, I did kind of feel like she reacted a bit intensely to that specific scene, but oh, it's fine. It's not like a bad offender. There's this third female character, Daeko, and when I say she's an offender, I mean she's a literal sex offender. I, oh my god, I won't even get into it, but just get ready if you end up reading this book when you get to her part. That thing traumatized me. It traumatized me. I, I cannot, I've been thinking about it ever since, and I'm not the same person. It's disgusting. And I'm not against disgusting things being written in books, um, obviously, like I love the first law, but it's the way they're written about that just really made me uncomfortable and uh, I, I can't even, I can't even think about it. I don't get it, right? Because I read Haruki Murakami's other book, uh, Colorless Tsukuru Tazaki and his Years of Pilgrimage, and I really liked it. I did know that Murakami has this reputation of not writing women the best. And I did see that a little bit in Colorless Tsukuru Tazaki, but it was mostly just the fact that every woman was just described by her tits. There was so many tits in that book. When I started Norwegian Wood, I was like, damn, I, there's no tit to be seen. And then it became so much worse. I, I really enjoyed Colorless Tsukuru Tazaki. I think I gave it an eight out of 10. Like, but honestly, like, as you can see, I would have taken the tits over what was going on in this book, Jesus Christ. Look, maybe I'm wrong because this is Harry, one of Harry Styles' favorite books. My favorite thing about the movie is like, it feels like a, like a movie. Anyways, that's all for me. And now I'll transition to the phone call that we had. Hi guys, uh, my name is Hinka. Uh, if you don't watch my channel, you watch Vera's. If you go follow me at Hinka Reads Books, I'm sure it'll be in the description. Okay, so, Misery. I adored it. Um, you have really good taste when it comes to Stephen King, and this has actually reinvigorated my love for him because I did have quite the dry spell after I read a few of mm -hmm. his books that I didn't love, so very happy about that. But I do have a few questions. First of all, what feature of it made it one of your favorites? just Paul's perspective like he's in you know as everyone says like it's it's a movie that, or a book that takes place like in one house mostly in one room but like everything about just the way that things are described like the um the tide the pain being described as a tide you know just like Paul yeah. Sheldon's POV is one of my favorite of his of King's POVs like it's him and then um Johnny from the stand or not stand <laughs> from the shining yeah no I have to agree especially when we get to like the craziness of the later part of the book no spoilers yet so don't worry but when we get to that latter part i 
I felt his anxiety. Like it's one of the few books where I was on the edge of my seat, genuinely like, wait, what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. What is is he gonna be okay? <laughs> oh. This is cricket. One of three. He's that. the only one who bothers me when I'm filming too. Aww. Like there's I have a multiple videos where I've had to cut stuff out of just him <laughs> the camera. It's always him. The others never bother me. My other question is something that bothered me about Missouri was that okay. Annie was revealed to be like an actual serial killer. And okay, maybe bothered is saying too much, but I'm really split on this mm -hmm. because I don't know if it was necessary and I and I'm not sure if it didn't like distract from or subtract from the fact of like she's supposed to be this crazy fan, but oh, she's not actually a crazy fan. She's like a serial killer anyway. So I'm 50-50 on that. Yeah. And I was curious if you had any thoughts. I hadn't thought of that until you started saying hmm. like why she needs to be a serial killer. I'm like, wait, yeah, no, because then she's already killing people regardless of the book. Yeah. So, oh my God, cricket. Um, so <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that because I liked the reveal and I liked him flipping through the, I see what you're saying. It does kind of feel like it, it's, it detracts from her actual drive to get Paul Sheldon. And she's just a crazy person who likes to kill people. Yeah. But I do agree with what you said. That scene where he looks through the scrapbook and like starts to piece it all together. Yeah. That was a really good scene. So yeah. So that's why I'm split, guess, right? Well, I think it, it could, you could say that like this is what got her out of retirement, so to speak, right? Because she hadn't done that in a while, I think. She wasn't a nurse anymore. Yeah. So she wasn't really doing this. <clears throat> she was just out living on her farm. And then happened to find Paul Sheldon. So, but I guess if you want to justify that, you'd have to look into more of her character. This is Cricket. He's a demon. He's been interrupting us this whole time. I'm going to let you hear my boy Per. Okay, do you want to talk about okay. Norwegian Wood? I do want to talk about Norwegian Wood. So, Reagan, Henka. Please explain to me the appeal of this book because you love it. Jack Edwards loves it. Uh -huh. Harry Styles loves it. Yep. No, no. So, I gave it um, just under two stars. I, no, not for me. So please, please explain to me because I'm, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> there are a lot of different factors that go into this book for me. Um, it was one of the earlier books I read as I was getting into reading. Like this took me like three or four weeks to read because I just hadn't, I didn't read much. And sometimes I did have to put it down because I was like, I need a good day today where I'm not going to be sad. Um, but I, I liked the mund mundanity. I don't know how you would say it, but like the, what I think is really prevalent in Japanese fiction is just that day-to-day -day stuff, kind of like how Stephen King does, except it's more calming and it's, I could really put myself in these scenes, not just because I grew up in Japan, though that helped a lot. And that's why I was able to see these things, like how probably he was describing them and know what he was talking about. Even though it was sad, it was still very calm and it kind of felt like home to me because mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a lot of experience with, and I still don't have a lot of experience with Japanese fiction and things that takes place in Japan. And so like, to me, it, it was one of the first really deep character studies that I had read and also the whole Japan aspect. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question. Um, like the fact that you spent a lot of your childhood. Yeah, so I moved over there. Uh, I was there for like eight or nine years. So okay. it was like middle yeah. school and high school. So it was all of my formative years basically. Yeah, so you were just younger than Toru Watanabe. Yeah, and I was curious if that impacted your enjoyment of the book because for me, okay, I didn't hate it, but I, uh, but I didn't like it. Wait, it is a did... very divisive book and I hadn't thought about like how divisive it is when I was like oh this is just one of my favorite books it's something I already want to reread so I should make <laughs> somebody else read it <laughs> no, figure out about yeah there it's it's definitely a book that you have to like want that kind of book have you read The Catcher in the Rye no Toru kind of felt like the Aldi version of Holden who is the main character like all the girls were like wow you're so like the way you speak is crazy oh my god mm -hmm. um oh you're so interesting where anyways it, yeah, but it's and, also an unreliable that's, narrator that's what why, i got from why it do you say that? I'm, I'm curious why you say that he is we don't know how old he is i don't think um as he's telling well no we oh. do know in the in the flashback but it's all a flashback yeah so we don't know how old he is as he's remembering this when his plane is mm -hmm. landing and all and to me it was this is somebody looking back to their 20s that's probably how he's gonna see it but it's not how it was so that, right. i don't know that's that's how i thought i think framing it in that way 
was why I just I didn't give it a one star. I mm -hmm. you know, I do kind of want to talk get your opinion on a certain character. Okay. Uh, Daeko Naoko's a uh, friend no. in the she's okay. like the uh, sex offender. I forgot <laughs> about that. <laughs> and then they have sex. Psycho. The the book. <laughs> and, and and okay yeah no yeah oh my god I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. One of my um. I have a friend who lives here in Dallas who I grew up with in Japan uh, and mm -hmm. we just happened to both be here and as I was getting into reading he was like oh you've got to read Norwegian Wood it is like one of the best books ever top five for sure so I started reading it and then I get to that scene I text him I'm like yo what the fuck <laughs> yeah um I think that Murakami has something for that because that happens in Kafka too she was like 32 I think and and the girl was 12 yeah and, it... and the girl was just so evil and like manipulating her and doing all that that was a weird storyline i don't know jack edwards actually i was watching a video yesterday where he was talking about sometimes we have to have these really evil terrible things in fiction so that we can think through the ramifications of, of those things yeah and i think if we look at it that way there's a because we saw the effect that that had on her that broke her and so if we look at it that way it's like okay i can understand the value in it in a literary perspective there that, what you said kind of reminds me of uh i don't know if you read lolita by nabokov not yet but uh, i i didn't fully read it i read the start and then i got caught up with work but the part that i did read was um the main character he says that there's a difference between children like little girls and what he terms nymphets and he goes on this like very long explanation of like some girls just like grow up faster and you can see like that they have these like sexual desires when they're like 10 and like 11 and mm -hmm. he kind of because the way that Lolita is framed is that he is kind of telling the jury why he shouldn't be I don't know, oh, framed or okay. whatever. and so he's like trying to explain to the jury like no no like she was a nymphette and and nymphettes like they they want it so i was just giving her what she wanted mm. where in lolita you kind of we have that segment to yes like we're supposed to see how that affects us the readers and like what our uh, reaction would be to a situation like that and it like tries to explore the psyche of that main character here i felt like it, it wasn't treated with as much care mm -hmm. because it's just, oh yes, of course, the evil 12 year old that ruined her life. But then we don't really focus on the fact that maybe she's also an unreliable na narrator, um, like Daeko. Yeah. Um, and just kind of the way that it was written just made me really uncomfortable and yeah. not in a good way. Yeah. yeah, I didn't, I did not like reading that scene. Did not like that that scene was there. I was just gonna say, I struggled to, to say like this you know x didn't belong in a book yeah. because i don't want to like maybe i don't get what the point was and i don't want to say i'm smart enough to know better than the author <clears throat> no i 100 percent agree what i would say is that it's the fact that watanabe never even like doubts her like there's mm. no critical thinking that's true going on his side and sure maybe like i'd be totally fine if he like came to the conclusion that yes I feel so bad for her of course because like children can be manipulative mm -hmm. um I just think that one sentence being like of course Toto wondered if such a her like if Daiko had any sinister I don't know thoughts when telling the story and if it was totally true but from what he knew about her and the fact that she was friends with Naoko and he really liked Naoko, then, uh, oh, he's going to trust her anyway. Like, mm -hmm. if something like that was in there, maybe that would make me feel like this isn't saying something about the author. Um, yeah. But it just, I don't know, it just made me so uncomfortable. So I was like, oh. <laughs> I, yeah, I think I had kind of like uh, subconsciously put that out of my mind when I think about this book because the rest of it I did enjoy. Thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. And thank you so much to Henka for collabing with me. All the music that I used in this video was actually made by Henka, so please be sure to check out his Spotify page and YouTube channel, which I'll link right there. Other than that, what do you think of Norwegian Wood? Are you a hater like me or a lover like Henka? And Misery? I'm so curious about how Misery would work in the modern world, so if you have any ideas, do let me know. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye